Well, hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live on my news about Tadesawe Kanda. Also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Okanse. Tonight, President of the National House of Chiefs opposes calls for a ban on small scale mining as interim measure for the fight against illegal mining. We have the details of the conversation tonight. The governing new patriotic party rejects calls for a forensic audit of the voters register threatening a protest should the Electoral Commission succumb to pressure from the National Democratic Congress and others who audit the register. We have details for you on this. Plus, here on your election command centre, we stay the steam on matters on elections. Stay with us. Also, pressures mounting on the electricity company of Ghana for its books to be audited over claims of non-performance of the electricity com distribution company, ECG. We'll tell you exactly why there's growing calls for an audit and then also the sacking of the management of the electricity company of Ghana, ECG. But really, will this whole proposal for a private sector participation in, in ECG's management Turn around the fortunes is a conversation we'll have. But stay with me. We have an exclusive coming up right now. A former Supreme Court judge, Justice William Atukuba, is going to be joining us exclusively here on Ghana tonight. He's going to have his take on this ongoing conversation of whether or not there should be an audit considered of this register that was exhibited with all the issues and the errors as identified by the NDC and also admitted by the Electoral Commission. Justice William Atuguba, former Supreme Court judge, is our guest tonight. He's joining us live. Stay with us. As always, you're an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. I settle for Ghana Bridge. The new patriotic party, NPP, has announced plans to stage a demonstration against the Electoral Commission if it yields to the National Democratic Congress's request for a forensic audit of the Provisional Voters Register. General Secretary of the NPP, Justin Frimpong-Kodia, criticized the NDC's demand, calling it hypocritical. He argued that the NDC lacks substantial evidence to justify a forensic audit. The creation of God, people are born every day and people die every day. So even if you clean the register today, on December 7th, there will still be dead people in the voter register. You cannot stand on that basis and make the accusation that are dead people in the register. These are issues that we need to think to and put it to the NDC that they have no case in it. The Minister of Roads and Highways, Francis Asen Sobuachi, has responded to NDC flag bearer John Mahama's claims that the new patriotic party has not improved Ghana's road infrastructure. According to the minister, the NPP's impressive progress is intimidating the opposition NDC. Our solid, unprecedented achievement in the road sector is serving as a major source of frustration to the opposition. And as a result, even the former president himself had a cause to wonder where the roads are. The point must be made emphatically that between 2017 and end of 2023, the Ekufuado Baumia administration had constructed an impressive 12,830 kilometers of roads.
An Adentan Circuit Court has ordered Bolt Holdings OU, the data processor for the popular ride-hailing app Bolt, to pay a lecturer and chief executive officer of a software solutions company 1.9 million cities for breach of privacy. The victim, Justice Noah Dade, had his identity stolen by a Bolt driver who was his employee. The Inception Commission has to be up and doing they have to be proactive in terms of making sure that these entities, not just the private entities, but even government entities, such as controller and accountant general, agencies that are responsible for taking people's data, are complying with the data protection principles in the Data Protection Act. But more importantly, I think we need an amendment to enhance the enforcement powers of the Data Protection Commission, so that by itself, it does not only just back, but is capable of imposing sanctions that bite. Central Regional Executives of the National Democratic Congress have joined forces with party supporters to demand the release of the party's Goma West chairman, who remains in police custody. MP for Cape Coast North, Dr. Mintanya Akun, described the arrest of Alhaji Kassim as baseless and discriminatory. Ghana. It is not for MPP, it's not for NDC. I'm a member of parliament. My contribution is towards the DRIP program. And if all of us are here, and then they have to give all the equipment that the government has given to an assembly, to a particular candidate who happens to be an MPP candidate, then I think it's very unfortunate. If they don't do the NIFU by tonight, they will feel the, the beauty and the revolt of the NDC party. The Democracy Hub is defying a court injunction to proceed with this three-day planned protest at the Revolution Square in front of the Jubilee House in Accra. The police have expressed concerns that the protests could compromise public order, safety and health and disrupt essential services. The only issue is that the police and the Democracy Hub disagree on the choice of location, that is the Revolution Square, for the planned protest. The service has duly communicated in a letter to the Democracy Hub that we are prepared to sit with them once again and agree on a location. More on news, uh, three news.com. Make some time and visit three news.com. This is Ghana tonight. And remember, there are so many ways that you can connect with us here as we go on and very interactive indeed. Coming up next here on Ghana tonight, here on your election command center, the governing new patriotic party is accusing the National Democratic Congress of bad faith in their demands for an audit of the voters' register. So, why is really this position? as taken by the MPP, one that the party is convinced about us against also what the NDC is calling for. We're getting to a conversation tonight. This is your election command centre. The new patriotic party has announced plans to stage a demonstration, this time against the Electoral Commission, but guess what? They say they will demonstrate if it the Electoral Commission yields to the NDC's request for a forensic audit of the Provisional Voters Register, as was exhibited. General Secretary of the MPP, Justin Frimpong Korea, criticized the NDC's demand, calling it hypocritical. He argues that the NDC lacks substantial evidence to justify a forensic audit. Take a look. As it exists now, by creation of God, People are born every day and people die every day. So even if we clean the register today, on December 7th, there will still be dead people in the voter register. You cannot stand on that basis and make the accusation that there are dead people in the register. These are issues that we need to think to and put it to the NDC that they have no case in it. 
Well, so aside from this, they say that if the Electoral Commission yields to those demands of a forensic audit, they would organize a demonstration, hit the streets against the EC on that. Listen. You also hit the, the streets to demonstrate yes. against, the, the, against the Electoral Commission. Yes. Then it will also mean that the Electoral Commission is not consistent. Mm -hmm. Because in 2015, it's the same Electoral Commission that told us that they have the body, they have the capacity to make sure that internally they resolve issues. So we ask them what has changed. It was interesting to know today as well that according to Justin Frimpong Kodia, the General Secretary of the MPP, they have also identified errors or some concerns that they have about the provisional register that was exhibited, right? They've also seen their own issues, but this time they say they are not going to go on a demonstration. They would meet the Electoral Commission on it and present their issues next week. Take a look. MPP has also detected some errors in the register. Uh, some including dead people in the register and some people whose name has been, uh, has been transferred or some people who wanted to do transfers but has not been uh, effected. All these things are what we are planning to send to the Electoral Commission next week based on what we have detected. And we expect the Electoral Commission to use their internal mechanism to address all those issues. Well, so that's the NPP there. They, they have also identified errors in the vo Provisional Voters Register. And they're going to present it to the Electoral Commission. Remember, the NDC also, after identifying the errors, requested a meeting with the Electoral Commission, made those uh, pointers and presentations to them. The Electoral Commission had indicated that they had already identified those errors themselves and had corrected them as to whether they showed those corrections to the NDC. That was one major issue we found out, according to the NDC, in that meeting, the Electoral Commission did not show them the corrected errors, as it had claimed. But what are the issues, really, at play right now, as the NDC presented it? But then again, we'll hear from the Electoral Commission and what they said at a number of these press conferences. Take a look. 3,957 according to the NDC, voters who were in the 2023 voters register have been excluded, deleted from the 2024 provisional voters register. This was the NDC's comparison of the 2023 voters register to the 2024 provisional voters register, and these were the preliminary findings. Also, they say some 2,094 voters transferred their votes in 2024, but their details are not captured in the 2024 absent list for their respective polling stations. This calls into question the legality and validity of the said transfers. 243,000 voters who transferred their votes in 2020 have been added to the 2024 transfer list again, thereby making it difficult to ascertain the accurate number of 2024 transfers made to the affected polling stations. The 2024 Provisional Voters Register and Transfer List are therefore bloated. And this is uh, the findings, and, or these are the findings and the verdict of the NDC after they did their own checks and then also monitoring of the Provisional Voters Register as was exhibited. We're to hear and see what the NPP is going to present as well. But after this, the Electoral Commission itself admitted that it had seen some errors themselves. For instance, the classic case of the Pusiga area, the constituency, where the Electoral Commission itself admitted that its officer there is under investigation because they had found out that he illegally transferred the votes of people without their knowledge and also the confirmation of those people. So that people didn't even know that their votes had been transferred because their ID cards were taken from them to ostensibly get them a loan. That's what the EC district officer there in Posica did. This is Dr. Bosman Asari giving details of that earlier. Take a look. The voters involved in the Tamale South 
a Sangnerigo constituency's incident have denied taking part in a transfer exercise. What they have alluded to is that their voter ID cards were collected by one Haruna Muniru, ostensibly for the processing of a loan. Preliminary investigations by the Commission have revealed that voter transfers were indeed effected for 38 individuals using the credentials of an Electoral Commission official. The Commission has suspended the Pusiga District Electoral Officer and has invited him to respond to the Commission's findings. Well, apart from that, the Electoral Commission also did mention other issues that they themselves had identified, uh, that they acknowledged that indeed uh, the concerns that were raised by the NDC had also been seen by them. This is Dr. Bosman Sari again. The preparations towards the 2024 exhibition exercise, the absent voters list and the transferred voters list inadvertently included all transfers that had been done since 2020 when this register was first prepared. This has resulted in a higher than expected number of absent and transferred voters. This understandably may have caused some anxiety to our stakeholders, as exemplified by the press conference addressed by the NDC in the Ejumaku Enyan SCM constituency of the central region. The Commission has corrected this anomaly and will share with all the political parties the corrected absent and transferred voters list. Well, so that's Dr. Bosman Osari uh, there, Deputy Commissioner of the Electoral Commission. But we're going to get on a lot more on this matter because a number of developments, as we've seen now with the MPP's position as detailed at the press conference earlier today, Justice William Atuguba is a former Supreme Court judge. Um, is going to be joining us in a bit to have a conversation on this matter. He, uh, as he says, he has a civic duty to do so. So we'll connect with him shortly. So stay with us here at the exclusive interview with the former Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice William Atuguba, exclusive here on Ghana Tonight. So stay with us. We'll be joining us in a bit. But coming up next, the National House of Chiefs had added also its voice to the fight against illegal mining. But in their view, they disagree with what many have been calling on the government to do. The details coming up shortly. Well, so, well, the president of the National House of Chiefs says that that call to have a ban on small-scale mining indeed is one that he does not think uh, is the way to go because those calling for the ban and also the declaration of the state of emergency may not have thought through the implications, the economic implications and other implications of the call that they are making. This is what he had to say. You all know I hate Galamse. I fight against it. It, however, does not mean that you shouldn't mine. We own the gold. There are good ways of mining. If you make an application, you'll be taught how to correctly mine. Those calling for state of emergency, a ban on mining, are not considering its impact. It will have dire consequences. People can lose their jobs. Do you know how much money we'll lose? Well, so that's the, the verdict of the president of the National House of Chiefs. And, and remember, it's always been the case that chiefs have been called upon to show leadership in the fight against illegal mining. We've seen what Tumfo say to the second, for instance, has done a number of these instances over two months ago, distilling three chiefs, sub-chiefs in the area. That's within his traditional area um, for their reported involvement and allowing illegal mining in their areas. And this is not the first time he's done that. Well, but just remind ourselves why this period of uh, this talk of, of illegal mining should not be just one that would end without nothing being done. We cannot continue to do the same things and expect different results. Look at that. Water pollution. We've seen what's happening to majority of our river bodies and the water company struggling to even 
as it were, uh, purify water because of the level, the increasing levels of the turbidity. Now, deforestation and habitat destruction, soil degradation is what we've seen as well, according to the, this is the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIRL, and the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. They've done their own research and observations on the impact of illegal mining. And a number of these organizations are not just talking, they've gone on the ground to do their own research on the situation we're, we're dealt with, health implications, the proliferation of non-communicable diseases, mercury pollution, and that's where the concern is. And, and according to the CSIRL, the fact that the water that you and I are drinking looks clean does not mean that it is actually not polluted. You cannot see mercury in water with your bare eyes. So think about it. You might just be drinking water or eating fruits or, or foods that have been watered with mercury in filled water, for that matter. Cognitive malfunctions in children and deformities in unborn babies. We've seen all those also reported. Bio uh, magnification in aquatic species and also uh, food chain contamination. Guess what? They talk about the socioeconomic consequences as well of illegal mining, displacement and livelihood loss, the threat to public infrastructure, and the, de the, the decreased investment in the mining sector, and the burden on, on the health systems as well. And this is what they are proposing the immediate suspension of all illegal small-scale mining activities in Ghana until there is support for sustainable mining practices. And this is what the uh, president of the National House of Chiefs also has a thought on this. Let's engage further people who have been talking about this. Awala Sewa is uh, the co-founder, uh, national coordinator of Eco-Conscious Citizens Ghana the environmental NGO. I will appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. So in the opinion of the president of the National House of Chiefs, the blanket call for a ban on small-scale mining and the declaration of state of emergency because of this crisis situation we're, we're faced with now may not have been thought through extensively by you because of the attendant consequences that comes with these calls the economics impact and so on. Is it the case that you didn't think through all of this before making the recommendations? Well, I mean, I'm very disappointed to hear this. We had a press conference organized by media against uh, Galamse, attended by a cross-section of uh, well-regarded organizations and peoples. You had uh, the Catholic Bishops Conference, you had the Christian Council, you had... Um, CSOs, you had uh, um, an appearance by organized labor, and you have everybody saying the same thing. We face an existential threat. We can't go on the same way and not having the desired results. So the best thing to do is to declare a state of emergency and then ensure that everybody leaves our forest reserves and our water bodies. And then we should pause community mining and also repeal Airlight 2462, which allows for mining in forest reserves, including globally significant biodiversity areas. Why do we say we face an existential threat? Unless one is not living in Ghana, even those living outside have seen the videos, have seen the footage. You know, it is terrible. The doctors have told us, if I should have mentioned that you have the Ghana Medical Association, the doctors have told us there's a rise in kidney disease. There are maternal deaths. There are um, deformed babies. All this is happening because of the uh, mercury and cyanide in the waters. You heard recently Ghana Water talking about not being able to supply water. And in fact, they've been at this for a very long time, but we have chosen not to listen. They've been warning us for years that if we continue at this rate, we'll not be able to have water. And let me say one thing here. Even when the water is running and it's clear, it doesn't mean there's no memory in it. So we need to do something different. Mm -hmm. The president uh, put his presidency on the line seven years ago. What has improved? Things have gone from bad to worse. So anybody who cares even just a little for the um, welfare of the people of Ghana will realize that 
we have to do things differently. Right. We cannot go on business as usual. Okay. And that is why all the organizations that care about Ghana have come together to say, declare a state of emergency right. so that you can well equip the relevant authorities, the police, what have you, mm -hmm. to go to our forest reserves and remove everybody from there. Right. And also all the equipment that is being used to cause destruction. And in addition, uh, clear our water bodies of miners and mining equipment. And let me give you an example. Tell me. There's a place in the Western North region known as Atron. So they have a beautiful, pristine stream, the Atronsu stream. They said no to community mining because they knew it would poison their water source mm -hmm. and destroy their um, landscape, their cocoa farmers. Illegal miners went there claiming to have a license and they've gone and destroyed the landscape. In addition, the once pristine water body it has now been polluted. If you see and, the pictures, it's and, heartbreaking. And in fact, that's the reality that we're faced with now. There are those who also say that instead of the the blanket ban on small-scale mining, we should rather ban illegal small-scale mining. But then again, I will, with what we are faced with right now, even though some of the companies with small-scale mining licenses have been seen engaged in illegal mining, is it not? If, I, if one listened to or one read Professor Frimpon Boateng's um, report, he made it quite clear that if you have a license, but you go outside the parameters of your license, of course you are acting illegally. So you'll be involved in illegal mining. Take the example of Akunta mining, which is supposed to have destroyed parts of the Tano Nimiri Forest Reserve. They, insofar as they went where they shouldn't have gone, they would have been engaged in illegal mining. And there have been calls for the company to be investigated. And that hasn't happened. So what kind of message are we sending? That the fight for the fight against uh, illegal mining is not going anywhere because well-placed persons are involved and they are putting profits before the health and well-being of Ghanaians. And let's be absolutely clear. How much is the mining benefiting ordinary Ghanaians when they don't have uh, reliable water, when farmers are losing their livelihood, their cocoa farms are being destroyed and other crops they are growing, fishermen are losing their livelihood, and then the, we are being poisoned. We've all watched the documentary, or we should watch the documentary, Poison for Gold. So of what good is the so-called um, income coming from mining when we are being poisoned to death? You see, it doesn't make any, um, to me, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Mm. And you see, I will, uh, my concern here is that, you know, this talk and campaigns about illegal mining appear to be seasonal. I mean, it comes and then goes. Everybody talks about it. Uh, Fred Meyer says, look, it, it becomes more of a sexy topic. Everybody jumps on it, illegal mining, uh, we talk about it, and then the season passes without nothing concrete being done. Now, with what we are faced with now and this new season of Galamsey campaigns and Galamsey interviews, we certainly cannot be doing the same things and expect different results, is it not? You see, um, I think Einstein said that if you keep on doing the, something the same way and getting the same results and you don't change what you are doing, then um, there must be some insanity somewhere. We know we face uh, an existential threat. We're being poisoned. As I keep on saying, like a sport record, there's a rise in kidney disease, neurological disease, cancers, and so on and so forth. And we know that the firefighters and the arsonists, in many cases, are one. Highly placed persons are involved. If you take a transfer, for instance, we contacted the Western North Regional Minister and told him what was going on. But the illegality continued and the water bodies were poisoned. Now, we need to do things differently. That is why we've thought it out very carefully. We've put the welfare of Ghanaians, the health of Ghanaians as paramount. And we said that the only way to have some results is to declare a state of emergency, get everybody away from the forest reserves and uh, get rid of LI2462. And then it's not just a question about having a mining license. How many people know that even when you have a mining license, it doesn't entitle you to just go around mining. You need an environmental permit. You need a digging license first. You can't just go. 
But you see, our monetary regime is either weak or non-existent. That is why we are saying that pause community mining, small scale mining, even with the big mining companies we have, we find it difficult to monitor and to um, enforce. Now, if you have thousands and thousands of small scale miners, how do you manage to monitor when already we are allergic to enforcement, when already our monitoring regime is extremely weak? So because of that, we are saying pause community mining until you get your act together. But whether community mining or big steel mining, nobody should be in our forest reserves. Nobody should be on our water bodies. That is not negotiable. And rightly so. Ola Sewa, appreciate you. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Ola Sewa is a coordinator of Eco-Conscious Citizens, one of the foremost environmental NGOs that we have in this country. It's live here on Ghana tonight. Coming up next, the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASAP, has been tracking the losses of the electricity company of Ghana over the years and makes a strong case for the dismissal of the management of ECG. We'll tell you exactly why. They are convinced that this is what can turn around the walls uh, of the, the ailing electricity company of Ghana. But first off, let's hear from uh, John Jinapo, who is ranking on the, uh, the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament. Earlier today, spoke to my colleague, Evelyn Tengma. Dollars. ENI is owed hundreds of millions of dollars to the extent that ENI has called on the guarantee and government is defaulting on its debt obligation to ENI. WAPCO has also issued a letter to GMPC threatening to shut down the pipeline over accumulated debt of about $12 million. Clearly, the sector is suffocating. He says government has... Well, there you have it. And that's John Jinapo there. And in fact, this complements the point that the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP, has been making all the while. And they issued a statement earlier today, and we tracked what they've been talking about over the period. They put, and this is in millions, between 2017 and 2022, this trend analysis you see there, tracks the losses that the ECG has been posting right from 2017, 2022. 2017, they posted almost 300 million CDs loss. And we see that rising over the period. And right now, we're talking about almost billion. And this they put comparatively and juxtapose it with the revenue collection rate of ECG. And, and you should bear in mind as well that the ECG survival really uh, primarily is hinged on the, the amount of money they are collecting from the electricity that they also distribute as the distribution company of electricity in this country. As of August 23, according to ASEP, ECG was able to collect 40% in 2023 of their revenue september 43 percent october 34 percent and in november 2023 that's the only month that they crossed the 50 percent mark and, and, and collected 51 percent of the revenue and then if you fast forward to january 2024 41 percent of revenue revenue collected february 42 percent in March, 50%. In April, 42%. In May, 24%. In fact, in May 2024, 40% of the revenue was what they collected. And in June, 44%. And guess what? In July 2024, according to ASEP, ECG collected just about 43% of the revenue. That is from the electricity that they distributed. We were able to just account for 43% of it. So take a look at this. If you have, say, 100 CDs of electricity supplied, ECG collected just 43 CDs. So about 57 CDs lost. That's according to what is put out there. Is this a sustainable measure? Is it one that needs a turnaround? What kind of turnaround is it? Edward Bauer is Member of Parliament for the Bongo constituency. Also with the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament. Well, appreciate you. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Now, first off, 
there's been this growing cause for the sacking of the management of ECG plus an audit because of what we are seeing, this string of losses over the period. Now, from where you sit and your experience in this sector, what kind of audit or in what form should this audit take? Because the Auditor General has done his job on ECG. We've seen the rot that was also revealed there. Yeah, thank you very much, Alfred. I think that uh, the audit will give us some certainty about the level of our indebtedness. Look, anybody who is within the energy sector knows that the power subsector is heavily indebted. I'll give you a perfect example. In July, when as part of our, our consultations with the various players within the, uh, the energy space, in trying to draft our our manifesto, we met all the various players in the private sector and what have you. Now let's take the independent power producers. They told us somewhere in July that they are they are level of indebtedness or maybe the indebtedness of ECG to them was a moving scale of between 1.3 1.5 billion dollars. You have, for example, Ghana Gas. That takes gas from the Jubilee partners. They are also owing them roughly around six hundred million dollars. You have, for example, the OCTP players, who also are owed about the same amount of money. So that gives you already a total of roughly about two thousand, or maybe a few thousand something, uh, uh, no, two point something billion dollars. If you, if you take it even to this current exchange rate, that's roughly about 40.5 billion Ghana cities. But these are figures that we cannot ascertain. We just know them as rough and conservative. To be able to know the proper situation, it is important to have an audit. And indeed, last week we met the ECG and I had made a request, but they have not brought the information yet to the committee. That look, tell us how much you owe every player within the value chain. The, the generators, the transmitters, the fuel suppliers, and what have you. So an audit is going to give us a clear understanding of the level of indebtedness. We know we there's a huge debt in that area, and don't take my words for it. The World Bank had indicated that the energy sector is the single most thing sector that can cripple this country because of the issue of indebtedness. I say, I'm so, quickly before I let you go. ECG is saying that the PRC doesn't, at least based on their assessment and the, the letter they wrote to the P, uh, presidency, PRC did not take into consideration the measures being put in place to address some of the issues that uh, they identified. So what is in that letter may not be the true picture of the state of affairs at ECG. Is this consistent? So now look, as per the published levels of uh, revenue collection, the ECG, even after the introduction of the new payment system that they use, that, they, that is supposed to give, quote unquote, a digital platform for people to pay. One of the things that we have realized also is that PRC says that the average collection rate it's around 43%. Meanwhile, if you look at what the PRC gives as a basis for their, their benchmark, the benchmark is roughly around, I think the benchmark is uh, around 98%. They are telling them that they should be able to collect at least 98%. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, even with the introduction of the new technology, they said, which is causing uh, ECG a leg and an arm, as it were, the average collection rate is around 43%. So if that is the case, why do you think that we should believe that there's going to be an improvement on that? Right. Indeed, the situation is getting worse. Okay. And uh, recently, again, that was last week, when they came and indicated that, oh, that they have improved in terms of their collections. My question I asked them was simple. I said, look, in that intervening period, you have had increases in, uh, what do you call it, tariff. Right. And after you have an accounting background, you, if, for example, your collection rate was, say, 50%, and so in that 50%, you were collecting, say, 
every month you're collecting 100 NFT. Mm. Then suddenly there's an ink and you, you now collect 120 NFT. Yeah. It may not necessarily be, be because your collection rate has improved. True. It is maybe because of the fact that your tariff has increased. I don't know whether you're getting the point. I, I get the point. And I because mean... your tariff has increased, that is why your figure, your absolute figures are, are, are high. And so the only way to know that is to know how much were you expected to collect. To take. How much um, did you actually collect? And especially and because... And what you are seeing, which is supposed to be the financial regulator. Indeed, and especially because uh, we, we saw an increase in tariffs for most part of 20, 2023. Obviously, I can understand why you make reference to the the expected revenue collection target for that matter. Mr. Bob, thank you for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. Edward Bauer is a member of parliament for the Bongo constituency. This is Ghana Tonight. Stay with us. After this quick break, we have an exclusive with a former Supreme Court Justice, Justice William Atuguba, is joining us live here on Ghana Tonight for a conversation on the calls for an audit of the electoral, that's the provisional register as was exhibited. Stay with us after this quick break. We're back with that exclusive interview. He's joining us right now. Welcome back. This is your election command center, Ghana Tonight. And let's go straight into it, as I promised you, an exclusive interview with a retired justice of the Supreme Court of the Republic of Ghana. He has a wealth of experience sitting through as a panel, in fact, a judge on a number of these uh, election petitions that we've had in this country. He knows exactly how things play out when it comes to concerns and, and issues about our electoral system as a country. Justice William Atuguba, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Thank you. It's good to have you. First off, and I know that you, you've been uh, following how things are playing out with respect to the concerns that the NDC has raised about the errors identified in the provisional register that was exhibited. Other political parties have also aligned with those concerns. The Electoral Commission says, well, they've also identified those errors, but they have corrected them. So really, there's no need for an audit. Where do we go from here? Well, um, so uh, the final word reports to be that uh, the corrections have been made, and that's the end of it. The uh, matter ends there, as I understand what your briefing. Yes, essentially, they say that, well, because they have done those corrections. There is really no need for an, an audit, even though the NDC says that they have not seen the corrections that the Electoral Commission saying they have done to the errors. As a matter of fact, does the that that uh, looks very absurd to me, and uh, <clears throat> I don't intend to be abusive, but uh, to make the point very forcefully, I think it's dictatorial to take that posture uh, because the constitution gives them the power but that power is uh, circumscribed by other provisions of the constitution let's look at their powers briefly uh, just the relevant parts <clears throat> so 45 uh, clause Clauses A uh, and D are as follows. The Electoral Commission shall have the following functions. A, to compile the register of voters and revise it as such periods as may be determined by law. D, to educate the people on the electorate, electoral process and its purpose. That's even false here a bit. Is that proper education? Uh, just to tell people who have pointed out grievances, which you have acknowledged exists. And then 
uh, after after that, you say that's the end. We've affected the Russia. You have not seen them, and that's the end of it. Is that proper education of the people on the electoral process and its purpose? I mean, to uh, have blind trust in the mere ipse dixit of the electoral commission. I say, because that said so, that's the end. That's a dictatorial posture to take. And for me, others can have their views, but looking at this constitution in the round, that kind of situation is entirely outside the boundaries of the constitutional order put in place. Um, the other provision impinging on the powers of the Commission or anybody given power under the Constitution is Article 1, Plus 1. Let us always revisit that provision. It is the most important provision in the entire Constitution. It says, Article 1, Clause 1, the sovereignty of Ghana resides in the people of Ghana, in whose name and for whose welfare the powers of government are to be exercised in the manner and within the limits laid down in this constitution. So the, the, all exercise of constitutional power is to be geared towards the interests and welfare of the people as the sovereign of the country. And mm. I'm at pains to see how a sovereign power whose interests and welfare have to be served by all donors of constitutional power can be just dismissed outright. Oh, we've had your, gone through your complaint, we've affected uh, the corrections. And from social media, they are not even saying they've corrected all, say most of them. And that should be the end of it. To me, that is running, uh, to use an old expression, a chase and fall. Uh, as a chariot drawn by horses, by horses in the old days. Mm. Uh, through the, the provisions of the Constitution. Nobody, and I want to emphasize, nobody has absolute power that detracts from the welfare and interests of the people under this Constitution. That's a central requirement. And I'm sorry, in Africa, and particularly in this country over the years, people just look at power in absolute terms. I'm sorry. You look at the power conferred, you look at all the other coexisting provisions. They are relevant to the essence of your power. Now, let's look at Article 3, clauses 3 and 4. Well, this part of your time factor, all they are saying is that every person um, Now, all citizens of Ghana shall have the right and duty at all times. At all times. And that's at all times, anywhere. Because time does not exist in the vacuum. It hmm. must be allied to a place. And so that's part of the at all times. And so every citizen, I want to emphasize that, every uh, three, four, all citizens of Ghana shall have the right and duty at all times to defend this constitution and in particular to resist any person or group of persons seeking to commit any of the acts referred to in clause three mm. of this article. 
Now, let's forget about overthrowing the constitution. But overthrowing the constitution by any unlawful means, is there any unlawful means? Not necessarily by violence or anything. Hmm. Anything that is not in line with the constitution, any means. And, 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 and that includes it going into, in an election, into an election with, with a, a, an electoral role that has concerns? Oh, sure. It's not a, a, pro, a provision of the constitution. Right. And uh, it's part of the point. Every citizen has the right at all times to defend the constitution. That even is enough. Of the other aspects of our abrogation or so, they are all part of the constitution. So you know, the time is constrained. Uh, let's look at um, Article uh, 41 of the constitution, duties of a citizen. Um, the exercise and enjoyment of rights and freedoms is inseparable from the performance of duties and obligations. And accordingly, it shall be the duty of every citizen be to uphold and defend this constitution and the law. Hmm. And so, I mean, you just don't look at people in their face and tell them this is what I've done and you have to take it like that. If it's not in line with the constitution, they have the right to insist that you comply because they have the right and duty to defend the constitution and the law. Now, with your experience sitting through election petitions for that matter, yes. would an audit as based on what we are confronted with now, be one of the corrective measures to, as it were, s satisfy all of these concerns and answer all the questions about the provisional voters register as exhibited? Absolutely. Now, let me refer to Articles 296. Uh, 296, exercise of discretionary power, where in this constitution or in any other law, discretionary power is vested in any person or authority, A, the discretionary power shall be deemed to imply a duty to be fair and candid Is that an instance of fairness and candidness? I raise plausible uh, errors in the register. And you just tell me, oh, I've effected the corrections. Not even, or say, most of them. And, and that should end the matter. And you say that's fair and candid? Anyway. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> let's look at another provision relating to the power of the Electoral Com Commission. Uh, 50. 51, the Electoral Commission shall, by constitutional instrument, make regulations for the effective performance of its functions under this constitution or any other law, and in particular, for the registration of voters, the conduct of public elections and referenda, including provision for voting by proxy. Their power is to make regulations for the effective performance of its functions. Now, what does efficacy, is, is that an effective way of conducting an election? A serious discrepancies are pointed out uh, by a commission 
which the public uh, doesn't trust much. I don't know much about all this. I'm a lawyer. I don't have time for politics and all that. But what I do know from social media uh, is that people, uh, Afro barometer says at least one third of the people. Yes. Country don't have trust in the East. And so that's about 30, 33%, I think. Yeah. In and I've read um, from social media that, I mean, from what they are saying, unless they are wrong, that the Constitution is mostly comprised of politically exposed persons. I mean, in the first place, the person who exercises that power to be, if I mean, he is mindful of the requirement that the exercise of the power shall be fair and candid. You don't go and bring your stooges to run a national institution. Well, it is the president is, who appointed the, 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 these commissioners. Yeah, that's why I'm saying that their, their appointment, I mean, is in the first place, is fair and candid. If it is true that most of them are politically exposed. Is that a fair and candid way of... Uh, and, and should they themselves even accept those appointments? We are not serious. We can't be serious. And that's why we are suffering so much. People just enjoy the power without looking at the constraints hedging our, uh, the power around. That's the African mentality. That's what results in Napoleonic state capture, dictatorship of the type of Mussolini, Stalin, and others. Very amazing that this day and age, all this constitutional journey since 57, we can retrogress like this. Very painful indeed. And others, look, when I was retiring, a lecture was organized in my honor. At the end of it, I asked what I could say a few words. I said, well, I can just say one or two. And I, I reiterated Article 1 plus 1, that at all times, everybody should be mindful of that provision, particularly judges. And that what would pain me is that some persons can choose that clause which enables them to come to power in the Constitution. And once in power, they seek to negate all the other provisions of the Constitution. And they will get people willing and ready to help them to do so. I couldn't continue. I said, thank you. I went and sat down. This is where we are. And, and I sense the sense that, that the level of trouble and, and as it were the concern about the retrogression um, in our democracy that you, you talk about. I mean, what could be the possible implications of what we are faced with as you have diagnosed as Napoleonic s situation of the state? Well, uh, your guess is as good as mine. You, 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 I'm just a judge, so you, you probably <laughs> have a better background. But if you look at history, let's look at Kenya just recently. What's happening there? I think you followed what has happened there. Yes, sir. You saw how the president retreated. Uh, so many of his powers. And although later he had to raise certain taxes, but you know the far-reaching this thing here. He was supposed to do that. The people, look, I hardly watch TV, but by chance, you know, sometimes when I have a Sunday, I watch that, I sit by them. Uh, during that Kenyan incident, a young man was put before court, and the charge was read to him uh, his plea was being sought from him. And he said, look, he would continue the fight without fear of anybody. 
And they were trying to say, oh, but you have to please that. He has no time for that. He is standing where he has come from, and there's no turning back. The police and why not right? They couldn't, as witness his life. But we all know of the Arab Spring, hmm? beginning from Tunisia. Went to Libya, some other country, I think Egypt. It even went to Syria, although the situation there was not constitutionally as bad as the, the other places. Yeah. And, and, yeah. It's all what happened. And, and you, you think that Ghana is at that point? We, we are at risk of an experience like that? Well, but you see civil society organizations. For many years, have you seen civil, uh, the, 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 the people massing up and demonstrating here now and then and insisting on their rights and so forth? Have you seen that before? I mean, it's because we have gotten to a level uh, which has provoked that. And nobody knows how it will pan out if dictatorship... Right now, I'm sorry to say, but looking at things, if we're honest, and that, the importance is honesty, we're honest in this country, there's state capture of this country. Complete state capture. A negation of the Constitution. It has happened. A negation of the Constitution? Complete. How's that? I mean, you are asking me, are you, are, are you not in this country? You know, you, you've just made that reference. In terms of what is this Constitution uh, uh, being upheld? Tell me. You don't see the is Constitution being up upheld in any way? Is it freedom of speech? Is it uh, the, the fundamental rights and surrender right to um, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, welfare and all that? In fact, our constitution, let me read this thing. Um, I want to emphasize it. By your time is this thing. What it says is that the most sure the most secure economic rights is the right to uh, a good life. I mean, yeah, uh, about, the, the, the directive principles of state policy. Yes, it's there, black and white. Mm. I say it at Unati. Is that the stage we are at? Talking about the most secure democracy being that which is able to meet yeah. the basic needs exactly. of its people. Exactly, exactly. Is that where we are? So our democracy is not secured? Is that how to secure democracy? People, in fact, I get frightened when I think of, you know, on social media, you find tanker drivers, they say they are paid 700 cities. Some uh, Uber drivers, 300 cities. These people have been sentenced to death. Can you survive on this? You have no right to marry because you can't uh, sustain the marriage. Seven rents is not enough for yourself. How do you pay your rent? And Ghanaians are so money minded, the rents are high, and they, they don't have time for the rent regulations. Some take three years advance and all. I mean, I mean, huh? The tube of yam. So much. The least you can well, get is about cities. 30 cities, I think. Okay. So, a person uh, earning 700 or 300. Hmm? Survive under this. Now, look. Even as I'm talking, I'm not above risk, but 
The truth must be told. I've read on social media. Even some time ago, two or three years ago, a person as dignified, as high as the late, uh, what's, what's his name, Kwesi Bochi, then he gave a speech somewhere, and he came out on social media to say that he received death threats. Martin Amidu received death threats. I mean, is that a democracy? What are we talking about? What am I talking about here? Even the right to express yourself. I concede that some people to go off tangent. Right or freedom of speech doesn't mean being vandalistic, irresponsible, insulting. Huh? When the case of Tommy Thompson uh, Books Limited came to the Supreme Court, mm. they, they said the libel and sedition laws were not unconstitutional because uh, there cannot be a license to insult as one. They repealed them, not because they were unconstitutional, I think people thought otherwise and um, uh, repealed them. But what, <laughs> if that is done to advance constitutionalism, uh, are, we, are we enjoying constitutionalism? Death threats you see to people who are speaking their minds, criticizing the government. This day and age, God have mercy on us. And indeed so. Uh, Justice William Atuguba retired. I would want to thank you so much for staying up to even join us on Ghana tonight and speaking the truth as we are confronted with. And Ghana is glad hearing you tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, no, it's my duty. As a citizen, I read out the <coughs> duties of a citizen. You know? Yeah. But <clears throat> time is about what I want to emphasize this Constitution has in so many articles and provisions ensured that there should be constitutionalism in this country, constitutionalism, rule of law. That rule of democracy, the critics, people who want to behave as if they are monarchs of all the survey in this day and age, and not under this constitution. But Ghanaians, well, they are now rising to defend their rights. Can that happen under a constitution like this? And I think I've exceeded my time. Thank no, you very much. In, in, in fact, uh, you, you, you haven't at all. And we, we do appreciate this voice of conscience. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Justice William Atuguba, retired, a former justice of the Supreme Court of the Republic of Ghana, speaking to us exclusively here on Ghana Tonight. And well, we had a, a special edition tonight, exceeding the time for good reason. And we have a number of you also uh, contributing to the conversation across all social media platforms. Thank you so much, as always, for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. There's going to be another session with him for more time. But thank you. On behalf of the rest of the team, we appreciate your company. My name is Alfred Okonsi. Have a good night. <laughs>